Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, a gorgeous, strange, and menacing new knife from Ostop Hell and Best Tech. I get a custom Bastinelli, and we take a look at some implements of chaos. I'll explain what that means a little later on. But first, I want to show you what I'm carrying in my pocket today. It's always my first opportunity to show off some cool knives, and today is no exception. I'm carrying a knife that has some sentimental value to me because of its origins. I'm carrying the Spyderco Patata, the original Patata. They have a Patadese now, which is the uh, three-inch version of this. Uh, but this is the first one that came out, and it is a tip of the hat or a tribute to a very famous and um, long-standing uh, knife from Italy, from the island of Sardinia. And uh, apparently, everyone in Sardinia carries one of these. It's a great little, uh, well, all-purpose pocket knife and uh, picnic knife and food knife and whatever you need it for a knife. And not for nothing that uh, M the uh, this sort of iconically shaped blade looks like it might be uh, good for self-defense in a pinch. This one doesn't get much pocket carry from me because I'm terrified of dropping it on that uh, that really, really fine tip. If you look at it uh, from the spine, you can see how fine that tip really is. Uh, and because of that, it's actually very good for doing things like, do you get this when you try and tear a piece of paper out of a legal pad? how it, it sticks at the top. It never never comes out on the perforation. That drives me absolutely nuts. This is a great knife for, for cutting paper of all sorts. And uh, um, it's also a great uh, picnic knife. Like I mentioned, it's great for fruit because it's so thin and slicey. And uh, just be careful when you, when you reach the cutting board, you don't bear down too much on that tip. Another great thing about this knife and Spyderco's version of it is how beautifully contoured these G10 handles are. It's a very, very comfortable knife uh, to carry and to um, and to actually use. And this um, contour G10 really adds to that experience. This is an N690 blade, fully flat ground, as you can see. And they've got the, the great uh, wire clip that everyone seems to love from Spyderco. Um, it's, uh, it's great for the Spidey flick if you're left-handed and great for the thumb flick if you're right-handed. So I'm carrying that today. Uh, I don't expect to be doing much hard work with it, but uh, it's there in my pocket nonetheless. Also today, if in case any hard work actually does come up that requires a knife, uh, I have my old mini Griptilian by Benchmade, uh, and I swapped out the scales uh, quite a while ago now with the AWT scales, Applied Weapons Technology. They're a company that does... Uh, they build stocks and, and different fixtures and fittings for uh, hunting and military rifles, but they put their CNC and aluminum to good use in turning the handle of the uh, traditional um, uh, griptilian into something a little bit more substantial. That was my big beef with the mini grip was that uh, the grip wasn't that good, <laughs> actually. Uh, kind of small, it tapers off at the end, and very light with that kind of plastic that they use. And um, But I always loved the 154 CM blade, such a great blade on the Griptilian. So I got this uh, Applied Weapons Technology um, uh, scale set a few years ago, and I got it thinking someday I would give it to my girls, one of my girls, so I got it with the pink backspacer. You know, uh, I think it looks really nice with that gunmetal gray. And uh, something that I mentioned time time and again, I love how anodized aluminum wears. And this is uh, wearing in certain spots. And uh, I just like how it looks. It feels great in the hand. And I think it's a real improvement to the, um, to the mini Griptilian. And uh, probably for the full-size Griptilian too, though, the full-size does not, I don't run into the same issues of handle size and grip with the full size Griptilian. So, uh, that's what I'm carrying today. What are you carrying? Please let us know. Uh, I love to get emails. I'll, I'll get emails just saying, uh, like four word emails saying, like, Spider Co. Paramilitary and Case Peanut. 
and it's that's all I need to hear. I love it. I love it. Uh, you can also call us on the listener line at 724-466-4487 and just leave us a quick message. Let us know what you're carrying. Um, we talk about cobbling together a an audio piece with just people calling in uh, to the listener line. We don't get too many calls and uh, frequently I'll get uh, someone trying to order one of the knives from one of the guests we have on the show. That's not what it's for. Uh, you got to reach out to them directly. Uh, but uh, but do do call the listener line um, and 724-466-4487 and let us know what you think. Let us know what you're carrying. We, we really want to know. So uh, something coming up tomorrow night on Thursday Night Knives. Uh, we are doing an auction. You've seen it on, uh, I've been uh, talking about it on Instagram. We talked about it last week on Thursday Night Knives. Um, we're auctioning off the beautiful new um, Fox Knives made Black Rock designed Ryu. I'm going to put this under under the uh, under the knife cam here. This beautiful traditional style Tanto in nylox steel made by Fox Knives. Masterfully made by um, Fox Knives, I must add. Fox Knives of Maniago, Italy. I guess it's an Italian day here. Um, you can see the beautiful construction of this. It's got a crowned spine. It's got the... Um, it's got really nice, uh, I'm sorry, textured uh, canvas micarta. Sorry for the uh, mind lock there. It happens more and more. And uh, giant lanyard hole, little noggin knocker on the end, and this amazing blade. It's a five and, five and three quarters inch blade. And let me just tell you how sharp it is. It is incredibly sharp. When I uh, first received it last week, I was in a rush to get out the door, but I wanted to check it out. So I pulled it out of the box and you know, you know how fixed blades come with these sort of um, cardboard slips over the blade so that they don't, they don't pack them in the sheath. So it was like this, I took a look at it. Wow, that's beautiful. And then I put it back in and somehow my hand was at the end of the sleeve and it just poked through ever so slightly and stabbed myself in the hand right there. I know. I'm starting a GoFundMe. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and it uh, it really it really cut me without any effort. So this thing is tremendously well. It's a beautiful knife, but incredibly capable. This is a knife that would be great for not. I mean, every collection, but it would be great for that collection that's full of folders, all folders, almost all folders. And then uh, I think I really want a fixed blade in that in that uh, collection. This would be a great one and done fixed blade, if you ask me. Or maybe not one and done, maybe one of two and done. Maybe you'd get this and something a little more campy. Uh, but excellent knife, we're gonna be auctioning this off and the proceeds will go to Ken Vehikite's GoFundMe. Ken Vehikite of Black Rock Knives um, has a GoFundMe right now. We really wanna help him, he's a great guy. A incredible knife maker. I have one of his custom monkey thumpers I show off all the time. I'll spare you this time because I'll just go down that rabbit hole, tell you how great that knife is. But let me assure you, Ken Vahikite designs and builds beautiful knives. And we're very excited and happy he's got these two knives coming out through Fox, um, this and the monkey thumper. So we figured it'd be a great idea to auction one of these off, see how much we could raise and uh, send that his way. So he could, uh, you know, be... Uh, be even further on the mend. So uh, be sure to tune in tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here, and uh, and and we will be auctioning that off. Uh, we, we've had great, great Thursday Night Knives recently. This past week was so much fun. We had, a, we had uh, four, we had three uh, people joining us on screen. It looked kind of like the Brady Bunch, just just uh, pared down a little bit. And we had a great conversation, uh, in, including in the comments. It's It, it really becomes a, a communal conversation. And we had a, a really great time. So be sure to join us Thursday Night Knives on Thursday night, 10 p.m. Eastern. So uh, let's talk about some new knives that I've got. And we'll talk about the state of the collection. But first, are you irrationally fond of knives? And do you like this show? Well, check us out on Patreon. There are three levels of support. You get Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the podcast, early access to the Sunday interview shows, and the midweek supplemental podcast with no ads during the show. 
And uh, there are other exclusive opportunities like knife giveaways. Your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show. That's hosting, servers, apps, and equipment, as well as knives for review, donation, and giveaways. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us can get you. Uh, the quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Oh boy. Well, not a lot in volume this week, but a whole lot in uh, coolness. So the first thing I want to mention is Ostop Hell. He was a uh, He's a Polish knife designer, knife maker. Um, he's He was on episode number 106 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Just a, a, a wonderful, charming guy with a, a huge talent in designing knives. Um, he has been making, putting out knives through Best Tech and through We and just knocking it out of the park. So he's got this uh, through Best Tech. He's had a few knives. They're all named after flowers. And uh, this newest one is by far my favorite. So look at this thing. It's a folding push push knife. I, I was about to call it a dagger, but it's not double-edged. Um, it is something I'm going to have to get. I think I have no choice. Uh, it's called the strelet, strelet, which is a flower that uh, uh, looks kind of like a bird of paradise to me, but uh, I guess it's called a strelet. And it folds up, closes, and then when it opens, it comes out to that 90 degree angle. So you've got this little uh, 1.23 inch hawk bill blade that comes out perpendicular from the handle and comes out between your forefinger and your middle finger. So uh, very useful, but also mm, something about it has that menace uh, that I always like in a design. Um, I haven't seen too many folding uh, push daggers. I've seen some custom ones for huge amounts of money. And then I've seen some really cheesy, cheap ones, you know, like gas station style knives uh, that fold into that sort of 90 degree angle push, push knife um, format. But here we see for the first time, I think that I can remember a really uh, high quality, beautiful design from uh, a very accomplished designer that is going out through a great company like Best Tech that manufactures knives uh, in, in a, you know, just, <laughs> I'm going to try and use a new adjective. Uh, very stout and sturdy and uh, well-designed knives, well, well-built knives. And uh, I'm really excited about this. This is one that, you know, each time he comes out with a new design, I really like it. And I think I'm going to have to get this. But this one is so unique. It's a moral imperative. I have to get this one. Uh, kind of like a kiradashi meets a hawkbill meets a push dagger. And uh, not for nothing, it looks extremely cool closed. Gotta say, really like how it looks closed. Um, so that's coming uh, shortly from Best Tech and Ostop Hell. Ostop, thank you for continuing to make such beautiful and cool knives. And Best Tech, thanks for keeping them within reach for the hoi polloi and uh, those such as myself. Very excited. Another unique and interesting knife coming out. This one's from Victorinox, and it's not very different from anything else you've seen, except it's a Champ XXL. It's a mega-sized knife with 73 functions on it. Um, you know, uh, we all have 73 functions we need in our knives, and uh, uh, this thing is going to accommodate. Just take a look at this. Take a look at this. I, I, I see all sorts of implements on this that... Uh, uh, that would be handy to have. You have two different kind of bit drivers on it. You have, uh, of course, you got the corkscrew, the awl, and the. I see two grocery bag hooks. I'm not sure why it needs two of them, but I see two of those kind of things. I'm not. I call them grocery bag hooks. I'm not actually sure what they're for. I see a paddle on there that would be great for stirring up a tincture or some sort of medication. Uh, you see a couple of full size blades on there. Is this overkill? Is this just something? that they're making to uh, to wow us. Um, you've got 15 layers of, you've got 15 back springs, basically. This, of course, like, like all Swiss Army knives and Victorinox knives, uh, in this format anyway, is a slip joint. So you've got all, you've got 15 layers of back spring there. And of course, uh, you know, you have some of the most important tools 
uh, that we all reach for our Victor Victorinoxes for the awesome scissors. And let's face it, who doesn't use that toothpick and those tweezers? Uh, I think they're the best, <laughs> the best toothpick and tweezers in the business. And the scissors always come in handy. But you also see things there like. Um, uh, a magnifying glass. You could start fire with it. You could do anything with this. You could open up a bottle of wine. Say you have a romantic evening, uh, you know, on a train between European nations and you're meeting someone and you want to crack open a bottle of wine and, and share the time with them. Well, you can do that with this here knife. So I'm going into fantasy land here. I'm going to, I'm going to extract myself, pull myself back out and just, just let you know it comes in a uh, commemorative case uh, I, I don't think they're expecting it to be something that most people carry. I think it's kind of a, a curiosity and a really, you know, magnificent collectible for that Victorinox um, collector. So uh, have at it, Victorinox collector. <laughs> Next up, uh, from one of my all-time favorite companies, we were just talking slip joints uh, because that Victorinox is a slip joint. Well... Who's my favorite slip joint maker? Great Eastern Cutlery, and luckily right now I'm not in a slip joint phase. Luckily my my junkiedom goes in phases, and right now I'm not in the slip joint phase. Otherwise I'd be falling all over myself to get this, and I I'm I'm sort of apologizing to the future Bob who will be falling all over himself in the future trying to get this and and lamenting the fact that I didn't when I had the opportunity. But the new GEC number eighty nine. It's a very large format slip joint. And they've, uh, they've had two versions of this in the past, um, both riffs on the fruit knife. This is, uh, um, the first one was a melon tester, uh, and that's what this is. It's a long, thin, slender blade, uh, the, and then the second one was called a riverboat gambler. Those were two, both two-bladed knives. This new one, the fruit knife, uh, number 89 by GEC, is a single-bladed, uh, which is how I would prefer it uh, if I were to get a number 89. And the idea was uh, back in the day, I guess, when uh, when testing melons and the and the um, you know uh, uh, the the ripeness or goodness or quality of a melon, uh, they would have a melon tester person who would open up their long slender knife and and poke it all the way down into the core of it, and I guess with how much resistance it gave against the blade, you could tell if it was a good melon or not. I don't know, uh, but anyway, that's that's the story I'm going with. And this new melon tester, uh, number 89, is in stainless, 440C, which is kind of what it should be if, if the intention is to, um, you know, test it in fruit, which is acidic, you want to use a stainless steel. For me, all of, most of my, all of my GECs are high carbon, and I like a patina on some of them, and that's how I patina them, with fruit. Uh, you will notice when you cut an apple with a high carbon steel blade, you'll taste a little bit of that steel on the fruit. But if you're like me, it kind of enhances the flavor of the fruit um, because you know deep down you're getting the patina that you want on the blade and it's maybe not all about the fruit. So Melon Tester number 89, I'm sorry, they're not calling it the Melon Tester. That was an earlier iteration. They're calling this the fruit knife, which is different to me. I always think of the curved blade for a fruit knife, but the number GEC 89 fruit knife is coming and it's going to have two covers so far, that dark acrylic that you saw in that picture and uh, some sort of wood, I think probably ironwood. Um, so we'll be looking forward to that and I'll be looking forward to the pictures all over the internet and Instagram. Uh, so still to come on the show, we're going to look at the state of the collection. We'll talk about a, a knife that I have in uh, from the pass around group and a new knife that I got and one from the vault. And then we will take a look at implements of chaos. And uh, by that, I mean mm, things in my collection that uh, don't really get much use. Thank God. Uh, but first, before we dig into that, be sure to like, comment and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you're notified every time I upload a new video and join us tomorrow night for Thursday Night Knives, our weekly live stream where you have the opportunity to join the conversation live and on screen. It's a lot of fun. 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube. That's Thursday Night Knives tomorrow night, every Thursday night, right here at 10 p.m. Eastern, every Thursday night.
Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. That's right. I chose this shirt to match this new knife I got, this Bastinelli Creations knife. It is a collaboration with the great and powerful Doug Markaita, and uh, it's the fourth installment of a four-knife series that they created and collaborated on together. This one, uh, he's been teasing it for a while. Bastien Cove has been teasing this for a while on his Instagram and uh, finally released a, a week ago, and I immediately ordered it uh, from him so that I could get his gorgeous cord wrap on it. This is the anomaly. Look at this thing. So as you can see, it's a ringed knife, much like a karambit, except the blade is in Pical style, so it's tip down and edge in. And uh, I'm gonna use my right hand here. I'm gonna reach across. It is a just fantastic, beautiful knife and I've been uh, and very dangerous I gotta say I've been uh, wearing it on my belt for the last two days and figuring out uh, kind of how to how to use it and how to wrap my mind around a ringed knife with the Picall style blade you know as you know I've been carrying the Victorinox fruit knives and then uh, sort of graduated to the Copus Designs and uh, Copus Designs Ed Calderon Elvia collaboration knife, which is awesome too. Um, but this is the first Picall style knife I have with the ring on the end. So I'm just uh, figuring this all out and how you can use it in a, um, like a karambit, but also very differently from a karambit because of uh, the dynamics of the blade, how the blade, you know, how you have to use the blade. It's a, it's a more thrusty, uh, stabby kind of blade than slashy, um, you know, karambit style thing. So uh, really it is a thing of beauty that I don't ever expect to actually use. Look at this gorgeous cord wrap. I love the way he does these uh, cord wraps. So you can get knives. Uh, this is now out on Blade HQ, I believe, and some other places, um, but it's without the cord wrap. It's just uh, like the, like the um, diagnostic or the Pika and the other knives he makes that are just sort of raw metal. And those are also great. I carry a diagnostic daily. Uh, that's the little two finger karambitoid uh, neck knife. But I knew that I would want a little extra grip and I saw a version of this that he put up with this beautiful maroon cord wrap and I jumped on it. I love the cord wrap. I'm going through a cord wrap phase, people. I just ordered a BGM also uh, in with the cord wrap that he does, uh, John. Um, so this is my new custom anomaly. And uh, look at that wicked blade. This is N690 CO, a very common uh, European steel. And uh, I'm just so psyched to have this in my collection and on my belt. Now look at the sheath he made for me. I believe when you buy knives, uh, they're... I, I hate to say it this way, but the run of the mill knives from Bastinelli, literally, uh, that come from Fox knives, you get a Fox sheath. But when you order custom from him, you get the uh, his sheath. And the attention to detail is excellent on this sheath. I love the way the one side uh, offers a little bit more protection, uh, as this will most likely be the side that's against your skin. I really do like that. And it's nice, thin kydex. It's not that big, fat, eight mil kydex. And uh, it just did a beautiful job on the sheath. So the whole package is is quite a nice a nice thing, and I'm I'm very very happy to have this and lucky to have this in my collection. So Bastinelli, Bast, uh, Bastian Coves, uh, just an amazing knife maker. Really a great guy too. We've had him on the show here, and he's been on. Uh, we we had him on a on a um, town hall. Just an excellent guy. All right, next, from the Pass Around group, from a, a design by another excellent guy, uh, Alan Alishowitz, another another um, friend of the show and legendary knife maker. This is the SIG-branded Hogue-built 
Alishowitz designed X5 Emperor Scorpion. Love the name. This is a, a button lock tactical that they also do uh, in an automatic version. This is just, this is the manual version. And uh, it's a really interesting knife. I've had it for about a week and I have mixed feelings about it. My feelings uh, are as follows. I love the way it looks and I love the way it feels in hand in one position. And that's like this in a, in a, in a full saber grip with, or sometimes they call it Filipino grip when you put your thumb back here, but, but uh, just a saber grip with the thumb on the back of the blade. It fits my medium sized hand perfectly. I think if your hand is any larger, it might be an issue. It might, the ergonomics of this might really force you into, into a certain position that might, I don't know. It, it's not a neutral handle. As you can see, you've got a giant uh, swale here that is supposed to accommodate your three fingers. And then this choil here, which accommodates your forefinger and acts as a guard too with that flipper. But the problem I have is with this second swale, um, it, it doesn't fit my whole three fingers there. And, um, my pinky ends up landing right on this peak, this bird's beak at the end. Maybe the, maybe this was intended for larger hands so that the pinky and the ring finger are separated like this by the, um, by that bird's beak there. I, I'm not sure because when you have it in a saber grip, which is, uh, kind of backed down like this, it fits right between the, the ring finger and pinky and, and uh, sort of works a little bit better. So all I'm trying to say is beautiful knife with an incredibly ground blade. I mean, this blade is broad, somewhat thin in stock, but you've got a saber grind here that comes to an incredibly sharp edge and is quite thin behind the edge. But the handle to me is just a little too committed. You're kind of committed to one grip. Um, of course, you know, you can grip it any way you want, but not with an incredible amount of comfort. When it's open, you can use this lock to lock it open so that you don't accidentally, if you're working hard with it, you don't accidentally push that button lock and close it. Uh, the button lock works very well. And like some other um, Hogue built button locks I've experienced, it kind of comes to a little stop right there and then you click it in. When you're closing it, you can swing it and then it comes to an almost closed position and then you click it in. unless you really flip, flick it in hard, then you can get it to stay in. Um, would I get this knife myself? I, I wouldn't. Um, but if the handle were a little different, I most definitely would. This comes in a very interesting looking Warncliffe style blade too. If you're familiar with Alan Elishowitz's designs, he makes a really interesting um, sort of multi-ground, compound ground Warncliffe uh, for uh, Hogue and uh, uh, incident or consequently uh, Sig also carries that. And, and to me, that would be more tempting because it's a very, very interesting looking blade. You've got a deep carry pocket clip that comes at a slant, which I really like because this works very well in, um, you know, sort of khaki pants or any sort of pants, unlike jeans that have a slanted uh, um, sort of canted opening. This nestles in very well and, and leaves the knife hanging in your pocket at the proper angle. So an interesting, interesting knife, uh, aluminum handled knife. This has a CPM 154, one of my favorite steels. So there's a lot about this knife to like. Uh, just a couple of little details that, um, that leave me uh, out in the cold just a little bit. That's the Hogue made SIG X5 Emperor Scorpion. Uh, and that's from the Pass Around Group. All right, uh, just a quick note on a knife I got a little while ago that I waxed poetic about, uh, the Bark River Boon II. I got it and I called it, uh, you know, rightly so, an, um, an American knife. This is like the kind of knife that uh, people have been wearing on their hips for you know, several hundred years here in this country. It's just sort of a generic, not generic, don't want to say that, just a clip point blade that's... Uh, a reasonable size in a beautiful sheath. And, and I got it and, and I was saying, I'm going to use it. This is going to be this summer. This is going to be my, my outside work knife. When I'm out in the back, I'm going to uh, put the tops, um, 
the tops to the side for a while and and use a bark river. I tend to get bark river knives and then and then they become safe queens. And this one I didn't want uh, just due to the spirit of the thing. You know, I I made a couple of videos and commented on how this is uh, such a uh, sort of iconic work knife style thing. So I decided I would put it to work. Well, I finally have. And uh, two weekends in a row, uh, I've used this out back divining. The vines are going nuts here in, in Virginia now. And uh, I have some saplings trying to strangle out a tree that, that I've been cultivating for a number of years. And so I did a little bit of swiping with all that stuff yesterday. And I, I didn't clean it. I didn't, I didn't clean it so that you could see that I actually put work into it. But um, this is 3V steel. And my first experience actually using 3V, I have a few other knives in 3V that have, like I said, they've been uh, sp spending a lot of time as uh, queens in the safe. Uh, but this one, man alive, it really, really just chewed through everything I was using it for. I did a lot of hacking with this. You can kind of uh, back up onto the handle here with this knob on the end and, and do light hacking. It's got a convex grind, which is a great grind for that kind of uh, that kind of use. And the 3V is just awesome. And I'll tell you why I, you know, I was intending to use it outside, but the thing that really got me to use it was this beautiful sheath, uh, which is, you know, just part of the whole thing. And is I, I got some nastiness on it, and two little spots that I stained, and I was like, well, now I'm going to bring it out and actually you know, start using the blade because the sheath is no longer perfect. The whole thing is no longer perfect. It's no longer pristine. So it's time to take it out and use it. So very, very excited. This, this will be this uh, summer's outdoor, you know, uh, light for me, it's, it's the hardest use that any of my knives get, but on the general scale of things, it's, it's pretty light use, I got to say, but that's what I'm going to be using. This is what I'll have on my hip. While I mow the lawn, yes, I'm that guy who walks around with a fixed blade on his on his belt as he mows the lawn. And, uh, well, I look forward to seeing how well this does. And uh, I only foresee stropping this and not really doing any sharpening because uh, it's such a tough and, and great steel. So the Boone II, an excellent knife. Uh, it's no surprise by Bark River, uh, but now I've proving it to myself in, in the kind of use I use fixed blades for. All right, before we move on uh, to the implements of chaos, I have one more knife that I, I wasn't planning on showing. Um, I kind of forgot all about it. I talk about old knives from the vault. This one is really going back. Last, uh, last one I pulled out from the vault was the SOG Wildcat folding knife um, from 1991. Psh. That's like yesterday compared to this knife. This one I got in seventh or eighth grade. So that's like uh, 1984, 85, something like that. This is the Explorer brand. I don't know if you remember Explorer, tactical boot knife. And this knife, uh, <laughs> so you see these uh, attachments on the, on the end of the sheath and on both sides of the sheath. This was to set you up for either leg carry, you know, I had a strap that you could, a Velcro strap that would go around your ankle or around your calf and you could wear this on your leg. Or the reason I got it, and I got it with my best friend, Mike, he got one at the same time. And uh, it came with a shoulder holster rig, which was really necessary for our hardcore eighth grade lives. And uh, so this, we called it the TBK, tactical boot knife. And man, we loved these knives. Um, I carved, took the quillions off of mine. It had two uh, rubber quillions that came out. And over the years, I finally got this uh, back edge sharp. Uh, when I was really concerned about sharpening that back edge, I had no no real way of doing so. So uh, it just took a lot of time with abrasives, not knowing what I was doing to get this thing sharpened. It's 440C or 440. I don't know if it's C. It was built in Japan back when things were built in Japan more than China and uh, by Explorer brand. A funny little story around this knife. Uh, my friend Mike's dad was a was a big muckety muck at a at a hotel and resort chain. And every year uh, at New Year's, we would go to the main hotel in downtown 
and uh, there would be a giant party and his parents would go off and they were all black tied. And my friend Mike and I would just kind of run around the hotel like, like crazy kids. And uh, we both had our tactical boot knives on this year uh, in the shoulder rig under our, under our um, trench coats. And we had ties on. We thought we were all like Duran Duran slick walking around thinking maybe this is the year, you know, we meet some girls here and we just thought we were the coolest thing. So anyway, we go into the bistro there to get some dinner. We both take off our jackets and we see the tactical boot knife on the other. we both have these shoulder harnesses with the knife. And uh, so we quickly put our coats back on, sat down and ate in our coats. Really cool, really smooth. And uh, yeah, so that tactical boot knife will, will always have a, a, a place in my heart, even though I don't use it now it, it's one of the bathroom knives, just in case, uh, in one of the bathrooms in our house, a guest bathroom, just in case you're getting attacked while you're in the John, uh, mom or dad, when you're visiting, you know you have the tactical boot knife here uh, to take care of you. So that's been the state of the collection. I, I know it's a little goofy, but it's not just about new knives in the collection. It's also about being grateful for what you already have. Um, so uh, very happy to show that thing off. So let's get to the main topic of conversation today, implements of chaos. Now, when I talk about implements of chaos, these are, some of them have blades for sure, but these are things that you, you if you're using them, you know things have gone wrong. And uh, I, I like those kind of products. I like those kind of things. And uh, I am lucky that I don't have a lifestyle where it's come up, but who knows, man, who knows what could happen. And uh, you want to be prepared um, here. I have one that uh, just was on my desk that I, I'll bring up. This isn't in the official list here, but this is, this is one of those plastic knives from cold steel. It's their FX G series. This is a ring dagger and it's made from, you know, high, high impact plastic. And it's meant, to be something that you stash. I have something like this in the shower. Uh, this is something that you can stash in flower pots outside or, or wherever you want. I know a lot of people look at it and they're like, oh, well, that's so that you can bring it on an airplane. Um, I guess you could look at it that way, but really it's a, a, a last ditch weapon for self-defense that you can kind of stash around the house. That's how I look at it. You could leave it outside and not worry about it um, rusting or anything like that. And uh, it's part imagination, but also part preparation, right? I mean, why not? Why not be prepared? We do, uh, we've all seen the clothes, the, uh, the camera footage of people doing bad things to other people. Why not have an advantage? So this is an Im implement of chaos. Uh, and I I'll show you some others. Incidentally, this uh, ring is not meant to be used like a karambit. I don't believe this is really to add force in a downward thrust. I believe, you know, you put your thumb through there and uh, well, you can imagine the rest. So I'm going to put this aside and start with my official list of implements of chaos. Now this, this idea came up from a knife that uh, Dave from this old sword blade reviews sent me and uh, still going to figure out what to do with this, whether I'll auction it, give it away or, buy it myself, but this is the backbite from Tops, And it is a knife, but I looked at it and I was like, this is more of an implement. And I'm not sure why I'm making that distinction, uh, but it's sort of knife, sort of something else. Uh, it's, you look at it, it's got this straight Warncliffe edge. It's got a Warncliffe point. And, uh, and then it's got this scoop here, this sharpened scoop, half of it is sharpened from here to the tip. And you look at it and you might wonder, how the hell do you use this thing? I mean, you get the idea that the point goes into something and you get the idea that this sharp scooped out piece of steel is there for something. But I had to look it up. This is designed by a martial artist who specializes in uh, knife techniques called C. Despins. Uh, his first name I think is Colin, uh, I believe. And you can see him use it on YouTube. Um, this is how it's intended to be used with that scoop forward, tip down, edge in, and uh, you can do a lot of trapping with this, uh, trapping and thrusting kind of uh, 
kind of attacks. Now, when I say trapping, I mean you're trapping the arm of your opponent or something, uh, some some sort of piece of the opponent with the backside of that blade. The backside of the blade, which is straight and a worn cliff, comes to a very abrupt edge. It's more of a wedge than anything else. It's kind of, it's got the geometry of a of an axe, kind of. <laughs> and uh, you, you can trap and slash with that edge. And then here, you can punch. With a punching motion, you can use this front portion, this scooped out sharp portion for other kinds of gouges and tears. It sounds awful. I'm going to be saying a lot of these kind of words. Um, so it is more of an implement than a knife to me. I, I don't even imagine you could cut an apple with it. I guess you could hack it. Uh, so that's kind of my loose, um, my loose sort of criteria. Can you cut an apple even badly with it? Um, I doubt it. <laughs> so looking at the front, look at this tip. It's, it's for thrusting, but it, why is it so flat and broad here? You may ask. Well, if you ask C. Despins, he'll say, when you thrust this point into something, it creates it, it cuts in with the Warncliffe edge and pushes off on this back flat edge so that you create a channel in whatever you're cutting that's much deeper and uh, and more gruesome or more effective. I don't know what the word even is, but it accelerates the downward cutting of this triangular, um, almost pyramid in shaped Warncliffe tip and edge. So an interesting thing, uh, interesting design. And you know, Topps knives, they just, they go all out. They will, they will make some of the most crazy looking designs. Um, and I love it because they're, they are utility and um, purpose driven designs. It's just that utility and purpose is uh, not one that most of us like to consider or think about. So the backbite from Topps, uh, very interesting and uh, just an interesting implement of chaos. That's where that's where I'm going to leave that. Next is an old favorite. This is you're, you're going to see that there are a number of cold steels on this list, and this is one of them. This is the Warhammer. Well, since we're wide, Jim, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold it like this for a second. This is the well, not that way, that way. <laughs> this is the Warhammer from Tops. And Warhammers uh, are, are something that came out of the Middle Ages in Europe. And I know that, that uh, India has their, their Warhammers, and I guess, I guess the, maybe the American Indians too. But the idea behind the Warhammer is you're fighting someone who's basically in a tin can. You're fighting a knight. You're fighting someone with a helmet or with armor, and this is uh, meant to make their life hell in that armor. So the hammer side, the hammer pole side is for, this has gotten loose over the years. I gotta kind of shore it up a little bit, but uh, you can stun or kill someone with this hammer pole wearing a helmet and you can, you can bash the helmet and then you can flip this thing around and it works like a can opener. It's not only a spike, but it's a spike with a uh, sort of an edge on it. You can see it's a sort of pyramid shape again, or a diamond shape in cross section. So you hit them on the head with the hammer and stun them, flip it over, uh, you know, flip it over and drive the spike through the helmet and and pull him off his horse or 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 pull him to the ground, whatever you whatever you uh, whatever you got to do. Uh, back in those ancient or or medieval melees, that's where these things shined. You can see in the movies a great uh, depiction of the use of a war hammer in the final scene, the final big battle melee in uh, Braveheart. He runs into battle with his giant sword on his back, and uh, he's got this. He's running, ah, running into battle with his war hammer. And the funny thing is, is they show a slow motion shot of uh, Mel Gibson running with his war hammer, and you can you can see that it's a rubber prop because it kind of kind of bends back and forth as he runs. But you know what? I'll forgive it. I'll forgive it. It's such a cool movie. And uh, I, I was so thrilled to see a, a Warhammer in use that, uh, well, I, I can forgive the, the, the floppy prop nature of what he was carrying. Um, 
companies like RMJ Tactical, they make a very high-end Warhammer, which kind of sounds funny, high-end Warhammer, uh, and others. To me, uh, I love this Cold Steel. It is, it is not in production anymore. I kind of wish I got the old, uh, not the old one, the very last one that they released because instead of having this flat, smooth hammer surface, they carved grooves. I think they were across this way, grooves in it. And the grooves in the hammer pole are kind of, on the face of that hammer pole, are kind of necessary, especially if you're using it to hit something smooth like a helmet like a roofing hammer that has that sort of knurled um, hammer pole, it grips. So with this, with this one, with the smooth surface there, you're likely to glance off of a helmet if you're hitting a helmet with it. Um, not that this comes up in my day to day, but let's, let's, let's just go there for a second. Whereas their later iteration that had the grooves in there gave texture to it and would really dig into a helmet in a different sort of way. So, um, <laughs> something to think about when you're shopping for war hammers. Uh, does the hammer surface have any texture? And if so, you might be better off with that one. This also has these land jets. That's what these metal things are on the side so that when you're going against a guy with a sword or a battle axe and he's taking a hack at your war hammer, you can, uh, you can preserve your haft and maybe even chip his blade with these uh, steel land jets on the side. Maybe it's linger, linger. I'm not sure how how it's if it's a French word or what, but uh, there's your cold steel war hammer. If you can find one on the secondary, you're a lucky person. Hold on to that war hammer. Hold on to it tight. Next is a uh, implement of chaos that that uh, the idea of which comes to us through Ed Calderon, and it's the fruit knife. And this one is a dressed up. Victorinox, you know, I bought this at the grocery store, fruit knife. These things, uh, well, first of all, it's in, a, it's in a sheath with a little hook on it, and that hook acts to, so you can drop this thing in your pocket. I have a little cord on it, but say you don't want even a cord coming out of your pocket because you don't want to give away the fact that you're carrying a knife. You can drop this into your pocket like this, reach into your pocket, pull the blade, and this hook here will hook on the inside of your pocket and you'll unsheath the knife. So this is just a fruit knife, a curved two inch blade. Yeah, it's about a two and a half inch, two and a quarter inch blade. And uh, it can really be put to, um, to good effect from what I hear and for what I've seen from people training with these, either in sort of Libra fighting style or, um, you know, Ed Calderon's kind of... Uh, the way they do things there. And the idea is you you hold it in a Pical style, edge, edge in, tip down, and in a um, you know life or death situation when you have adrenaline flowing through your body and you don't have much in the way of fine motor skills, if you can swing it and you can make contact with it, you can do a lot of uh, hooking, stabbing, and tearing with this blade like a cat's claw you know, and uh, follow, you know, using the arc of your wrist and the arc of your elbow and your shoulder, you can put this thing to great effect. I've done a few of these. I'm just kind of fascinated with the format, as I mentioned earlier with the Bastinelli. Um, you know, here's a, here's a more official version of it, right? I'm fascinated by the format and I've gotten a couple of different Victorinox fruit knives. They make this, this one and then one that's a little bit smaller. Uh, and I keep that one in the car just in case. And uh, it is something that you would end up using if the chips were down. Um, of course, we also have one in the kitchen and it's a great cutter. It's great for, yes, cutting fruit as the name would imply, but also for a low cost and sort of low profile um, weapon or implement of chaos, uh, these fruit knives work great. I have wrapped this with cord just so that it's a little bit uh, easier to grasp. It is a very thin and kind of slick handle. And then per Ed Calderon's suggestion, uh, and uh, as you can see on the Elvia, there's a little notch cut out here just so you can index it. You know, it's 
you know, it, it will retain it in your hand a little bit, but it's also for indexing. So you know where, where the edge is, where the tip is at all times, especially in a moment of fear and anxiety and adrenaline dump, you know, you want to know that you have the knife in your hand in, in a correct fashion. So for me, obviously this doesn't, uh, this doesn't work into my lifestyle much in that it, you know, I don't find myself in those situations, thank God. But uh, I like knowing that I have it and A and B, I just think it's kind of fascinating. So I have a couple of them and they're a cheap way to get, get a little knife fix, right? And then, you know, just a homemade Kydex sheath. So that's the Victorinox fruit knife. You know, if you're using it and you're not cutting fruit, things have gone south, but you might be happy to have this uh, in your hand. Next, another cold steel. And this one is actually called Chaos. They have a series and this, the Chaos series, and this is the Chaos Kukri. Now what makes a Chaos knife? If you ask cold steel, it's this. I'm just going to place this down for a second. It's this feature right here, uh, the knuckle duster. And um, it's used to protect your hand. It's also used to, um, you know, uh, uh, what, what do you want to call it? Uh, uh, accelerate the pain. <laughs> I don't know what you, it's a force multiplier. I think that's the, the proper way of putting it. Like a knuckle duster and a trench knife, uh, you could use it to punch uh, theoretically uh, it might be hard to punch with this giant heavy blade on the end, but uh, you can use it to punch. Also, it's got a skull crusher down here. Um, these Chaos knives are actually relatively inexpensive. Uh, I believe this is cast aluminum. Maybe that's steel. Actually, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's not. it's got a through tang, uh, but kind of a rat tail tang, but also is fixed with bolts and this is a screw on the end. So, I mean, it's gonna stay in there, but I have I have seen some videos where people have busted these, uh, these chaos knives. Um, this of course has the Kukri blade, which is just astoundingly effective and terrifying. I mean, I would imagine with something like this, depending on the situation, you could probably unsheathe this and uh, who knows, maybe just the mere unsheathing of it, just like the racking of a shotgun. Uh, might send some people packing without without contact, which would be the best case scenario because you'd have a chance to show off your knife to the scumbag that you need to show it off to, and then you wouldn't have to use it. Um, this is a gift from my brother. I have a lot, uh, two things in this list that are gifts from my brother. Um, he gives me some of the coolest stuff. And uh, this Chaos Kukri used to live in the closet, used to live in my closet underneath my... Uh, underneath my jeans, but I've moved it to the knife case and have replaced it with something a little more wieldy. Uh, this is something you want to have some room to swing around. As you can see, it's quite large and, uh, you know, you don't need to move it much to get it to, to do what it's meant to do. Just listen to this. Sharp and Sharp and large. Okay, so that is the Cold Steel Chaos. Also comes in a Tanto and in a clip point Bowie and in a um, dagger, which to me is the most uh, traditional of all of those because I think of the um, 1918 knuckle duster dagger and uh, when I think of the, of the format. So that is the Chaos Kukri by Cold Steel. Uh, second to last in this list is also a gift. This was a gift from Alan Elishowitz um, after we talked on the podcast about this. This is the Hogue made or the Hogue EX or yeah, EXT01. And uh, it's a tomahawk, as you can see, and it has some interesting features to it. So you have a sort of hammer thing here, but it also has a, a hammer attachment that you can get to put on there and a very sharp blade uh, for the ax. So this is, I'm gonna put it down here so you can take a look at it. This is an interesting piece because um, it, it is a, for lack of a better term, it's a, it's a tactical ax, it's a tactical tomahawk. You could use it for fighting. Uh, it's got this nice hooking blade here. It's got a very sharp blade and a point here. So you've got points you can thrust and stab with it, but you can also slash with it because the, 
because of the sharpness of this blade. Uh, also, though, I've heard from a number of people, my brother-in-law was the first one to say this, this would be just a great thing, would have been a great thing for him to have when he was in Iraq because they found themselves breaking glass a lot. Uh, um, he, I'm not sure if he did breaching, but getting into stuff, getting into places uh, uh, by breaking glass or I guess popping open doors and such. And uh, he said that this thing would have been very, very handy. Uh, he was there earlier on in the war and um, uh, before companies like RMJ, at least I think, before companies like RMJ were, were kind of um, producing these things and uh, um, American Tomahawk was, was kind of just coming back. And uh, so they weren't as common, I guess, as they were later on in the war. And uh, it's small, light, and thin, and strong. It's one piece of metal and one piece of steel with G10, uh, very grippy, nicely milled G10, and a bird's beak here. So just, it would have been a great utility uh, tool for him, he mentioned. So I suspect that this market has grown hugely uh, over the past 15 years, you know, as the, as the wars have uh, continued. And uh, for me, it's the sort of thing that if I'm ever using this, uh, I know that things have gone terribly wrong because uh, tomahawks, tactical tomahawks don't really work into my lifestyle. And uh, so this this is definitely, for me, an implement of chaos and not for nothing, but it's something that is uh, very wieldy, um, kind of you could use it almost like a knife. A lot of the same techniques you could use uh, this tomahawk. In that way, and I, I really think that the mounting system deserves a moment. It comes on this uh, curved plate that uh, easily fits in the waistband. You can see here; you just slide it. You could slide it over your belt, or slide it all the way in the waistband and over your belt. Excuse me. This plastic gets softer and more pliable as it gets warm. So it kind of melts into your side. Yes, I've worn it before, just around the house. And um, it's got a very interesting retention system. It uses this cutout in the blade and there's a magnet back here, a strong magnet that attracts it and then you lock it in just like that. So you can carry it around and then pull it off very quickly. So a very cool design by Alan Elishowitz, beautifully uh, assembled and built by Hogue. And uh, it's one of my favorite and most mm, classy and valuable implements of chaos in my collection. The last one is a, is a cold steel. <laughs> so as I said, cold steel plays into this a lot. And it's one that I got to be honest, I wouldn't have gotten myself, uh, but my brother got it for me. And this is why it's great to have people who kind of know you. Well, my brother doesn't kind of know me. He knows me uh, like a book, but um, he knew before I knew that I would like this thing. This is the Rondell dagger from, uh, from Cold Steel. It's a sword breaking dagger. So I call it a sword breaker. The Rondell refers to the, the, uh, the shape of the pommel and the shape of the, of the guard here. Uh, really, really nicely made um, sword breaker. And what makes it a sword breaker? These edges here are as sharp as they can be, but really the thing is in cross section, it is triangular in shape. It's got these scooped out, uh, scooped out kind of hollows on the flats here. But this is not sharp, like you're not cutting paper with it. But if you're swinging hard at a sword, you could very likely break break it. And then you have this incredible thrusting tip. So uh, I mentioned before that the big chaos kukri lived in the closet. Well, this one's moving to the closet after this here podcast. This is, uh, this is making the rotation in. Uh, it's easily accessible. It's a little bit smaller uh, than the Chaos Kukri. And also, now I might be wrong about this, but I feel like you could use this as an impact weapon also. Say you didn't want to run someone through with the tip. Uh, say someone breaks into the house and this is the thing that's closest to you. Um, of 
course, with the pistol in the other hand. But uh, you say you don't want to run them through, uh, but they deserve a good whacking. Well, I think the sides, these sides here, if you hit hard with them, if you hit with the flat, it would definitely hurt and uh, cause some pain. If you hurt with the edge, it would hurt, cause some pain. Maybe, maybe split the skin. I'm not sure. Uh, but, but really, I, I feel like this doubles as a, um, does double duty as an impact weapon and as a thrusting weapon. Um, but I feel like the edges are not sharp enough to cut. So I don't know. Am I, am I, uh, am I putting too fine a point on it? Am I, that's not what I mean. Am I, am I overthinking the use of the Rondell dagger? Am I underselling how nasty the thing is? Not sure, but I'm happy to have it. Thank you, Victor for uh for actually beefing up this collection of chaotic implements and things that you would use in uh in this kind of a situation all right i think i've gone on at length about the topic and uh and i think that'll do it for this edition of the knife junkie supplemental podcast i uh, am a big fan of these kind of things they activate my imagination uh and the practical training i've had with knives through kali and uh Jeet Kune Do lead me to believe that I could use them in a pinch. Of course, it is about training, 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 and keeping up with your training, which uh, has been an issue as I've gotten older, but uh, I have a plan to remedy that um, through some friends. So that's it for this week. Come back uh, next Wednesday to find out more about my collection, more about what's new in the knife world. And uh, of course, join us every Thursday night for Thursday Night Knives. Tomorrow night is a very special Thursday Night Knives because we will be auctioning off the Ryu, the Fox-made Ryu designed by our good friend Ken Vahikite of Black Rock Knives, proceeds of which will be going to help his GoFundMe. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying, for this week, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.